What is happening, everyone? Welcome to Mailbag Monday. You are watching KMRD Radio Stuff. My name is Mike. Thanks for tuning in. If you got a question for me, shoot me an email, k8mrd at icloud.com, in the subject to put Mailbag Monday. And that way, I will see your email above all of the other worthless emails that I get. <laughs> Just kidding. They're not worthless. Hey, look, Dad, I'm wearing a KMRD Radio Stuff shirt. He thinks I never wear my shirts for some reason. Uh, you can pick these up at grapevineamateurradio.com, by the way. <laughs> Let's see. What are we on? Episode 22 now. 22 weeks. 22 weeks. We've been doing this, and you guys have been watching and writing in, and I thank you so much for that. And this week, we have more fine, fine questions from you, the viewer. So thanks so much, and let's dive right in. And this first question is something I knew nothing about. This viewer writes, Hi Mike, I need a recommendation for a good 60 meter wire antenna, dipole, inverted L, etc. Our Aries group utilizes 60 meters for MCOM traffic. So, great question. I don't know anything about 60 meters. Literally made zero contacts. I don't even think I've ever even tuned into 60 meters. But, I know a guy, he's a Canadian, we won't hold that against him, who pretty much does 60 meters only. So I sent this email to him. His name is Joseph. He's VE3GKT, and he writes, uh, I've used two antennas enough to talk about on 60 meters. A 40-foot random wire vertical on a spider beam mast, not a full quarter wave, but very close, easy to tune it, as well as an NFED half wave strung in an inverted V over a fishing pole. The fishing pole configuration is very low. The ends are about three feet up with the center point about 17 feet up. Okay, easy enough. The NFED half wave is effectively a very low dipole. And while I've used it to work Europe on 30 watts FT8 a couple times, those paths are much easier with a vertical. The low dipole bubble shaped Envis pattern is very noticeable on the air. However, those paths are not important for Bob and his use case. For most hams who would use the antenna for rag chewing, POTA activating or hunting or DXing, I would recommend the vertical, especially now that the band conditions are getting better. However, if the sole purpose of the antenna is Aries, i.e. relatively local comms, the dipole and fed half wave, a doublet or a sky loop will kick the snot out of a vertical. That's how Canadians swear. <laughs> if... If Bob can put up an inverted V dipole or NFED half wave with the center at about 25 to 35 feet uh, and feed it with a 100 watt radio, he'll be very pleased with the results. He'll have reliable comms for 200 to 300 miles in the daytime and nearly the whole continent east of the Mississippi after dark. Remember, everyone is 100 watts and there's no Yaggies. It'll be a very solid station. This will also save him the real estate needed for radials 73 VE3 GKT. So thank you so much, uh, Joseph, for answering that question, because I have no frickin' idea. And thank you for writing in, and now hopefully we all know what to use for 60 meters for Aries. So great question. Thanks for writing in. We all learned something. How about that? We've got another question about antennas. This time, it's not for portable. So this viewer writes, I appreciate all that uh, you and the other YouTubers do for the hobby. In scanning through content, I see a lot of info on videos on portable HF antennas. That's because portable is awesome. But not much regarding permanent base station installs. I know you love fielding antenna questions. So any thoughts or recommendations for a multiband HF antenna that would work well in suburban hell? Yes, I have several. And I've actually done a couple well i've done uh gosh i've done at least three videos on antennas that i've used at home uh but to to dive a little deeper into this question let's go over to this screen and, and let's just talk about the the antennas that i have above my house first so i i have two antennas above my house and i have uh the one that's directly above my house is the nelson antennas 49 to 1 and fed half wave for 80 meters, it's 130 some odd feet long. It works great, multi-band, resonant. I might need a tuner to, to tweak up some bands, but that's about it. The other antenna that I have that's actually at the end of the house and goes across the street into the neighbor's tree <laughs> is the Tentennas. Walt from Tentennas in uh, Tennessee makes a fantastic antenna. Uh, I have three he's got three different sizes he's got a uh this is the 100 watt version he's got a, a smaller kind of 
25 watt version and he's got a brand new one that's i think for about 10 watts that i haven't reviewed yet i'm, I'm fixing to do that very very soon so you can check out walt at 10 tennis now getting a little deeper the very first antenna that i ever used and made was a fan dipole now i i don't know i know that they exist commercially like radio waves makes fan dipoles um i just made one and it worked great and you can however many bands you want you just make elements for them and you're resident on all those bands like you can you can do them all and and they're they're pretty easy to make it's just a dipole you're just making a dipole for every single band so um yeah and i'm sure you can find them commercially Speaking of dipoles, one of my absolute favorite antennas in the world, the DX Commander, which is basically a vertical fan dipole. Uh, so if you don't have maybe the length to put over your house or something, or you don't have any trees or anything, the DX Commander is going to be a great uh, vertical that you can put. Uh, this is a picture of the DX Commander Classic that you can do basically anything from 40 through 6 meters. You can also do 80 meters if you do like an inverted L, if you have the room. He's got a new version. I, I couldn't find it on his website, so he must be sold out. Uh, but there's a new like 12.4 meter mast that he's got a coil at the top to give you 80 meters and 30. So that gives you, uh, what, 80, 40, 30, uh, 20, 17, 15, 20. I think you get all of them. Uh, with that antenna so that's that's Callum's newest creation and if you really want to go crazy if you just got uh, you know screw you money pick up a, uh, a a big tower and put up some kind of beam like uh, here's these are some step IR beams that uh, I, I was looking at their website their most expensive one was a little over 10 grand <laughs> so I think that was one of the five element Yaggies there. So uh, there's no shortage of multi-band antennas to, to use at home. And a lot of times the portable antennas we use are, are just smaller versions of multi-band antennas that you might use at home. So as always, the what antenna question uh, always stirs up a lot of uh, not necessarily debate, but there's a lot of opinions. So anyone who has an opinion on a great multi-band antenna to put at home you could do a four a, a nine to one end fed and use a tuner with it uh put your comments below i'd love to hear them and and uh you know uh, people can learn just from from reading the comments and what other people think so put your comments what's what's a great antenna multi-band to use at home great great question though love it thanks so much for writing in next we've got a question regarding worked all states this viewer writes I'm trying to get my worked all states certificate, but I'm struggling to get some particular states. Did you also find some specific states challenging? I have QSOs in those states, some multiple, but can't seem to get the operators there to confirm. Is it a cultural thing? Do some states have more hams than others? Yes, they do, definitely. I understand that Washington, Idaho, Alaska, and Hawaii may be difficult to get due to distance and band conditions between there and Tennessee. However, I have three contacts in both Arkansas and Maine, but can't seem to get other operators in those states to confirm the QSOs. Maybe I'm just being impatient, but it seems I'm struggling with specific states now. So, yes, I've had, uh, I think when I was living in Michigan, I think Nevada was, was like the elusive state for me that I, like I'd made contacts, but not confirmed so uh, like montana wyoming the dakotas you know that that kind of part of the country th there are way fewer people in in those states which means even way less hams and then of those hams how many confirm but so to answer this question i i guess it's it depends on what's more important to you and what has more merit i would suggest uploading your logs to logbook of the world and to qrz now, I'll tell you that a lot of folks just don't log or upload or they just don't care. Or maybe they're old school and send QSL cards or something. So they're going to have that. So let's take a look at my Logbook of the World account. So I have 11,864 QSOs. That number is actually higher because there's some dupes in there. And unfortunately, Logbook of the World doesn't let you delete logs. And I have 5,734 QSLs. So about half of the people actually uh, confirm on Logbook of the World. I would attribute this to a couple things. Some people just don't care. Uh, probably the bigger thing with Logbook of the World is that it's an absolute nightmare 
to get set up for a lot of folks. You literally have to sign up, wait for a postcard in the mail, uh, add some Gozar's key, whatever, to, uh, uh, to, to let you in. I mean, Logbook of the World is the hottest mess in amateur radio, and I wish to God they would fix it and make it easier. There's no reason that it needs to be this difficult. And uh, anyone at the ARL, if you're watching, contact me, and I'll tell you how stupid Logbook of the World is, and you can make it easier. I don't mean to be negative, but it is what it is. Especially people in other countries. It's it's very it's very difficult, I've heard, for, for a lot of countries to, to get signed up for Logbook of the World. So a lot of those DX stations you might not ever get. Okay. So now for me, I, I as much as I kind of rag on Logbook of the World for being so uh, just void of any kind of logic, I do kind of hold it in a higher regard for some reason and I and I can't justify that it's just well it's the ARL so whatever which makes no sense at all but it, it is what it is the other thing I would suggest upload to QRZ if we look at my QRZ logbook you can see I have 11,783 contacts with 7,175 of those confirmed and again some people just don't upload their logs looking at UKM 9G yeah Mr. Temporarily Offline yeah, you're temporarily off log. <laughs> so you can see I have a much higher confirmation rate in QRZ, and that's because QRZ does it right. All you have to do is sign up for a QRZ account, and you can start making logs. And you can see where people are starred and they're circled. I think the stars are just uh, QRZ confirmations. If the star has a circle, that means it's also confirmed in Logbook of the World. So more people in the world are using QRZ as their log to actually upload because QRZ did it right. If ARL would take a page from QRZ, maybe more people would use Logbook of the World. So, But the bottom line is some people just don't do it. They just don't log. I know people that do not log. They don't care. They just want to make the contact. It's not a thing for them. So uh, you do need to be persistent. I'll tell you calling CQ a lot is going to help. Doing parks on the air is going to help. I already have 50 states uh, on sideband, which is kind of my goal. The like mixed, I don't really care about. I, I want everyone on phone. I already have that. I just looked today. I, I don't even look at it, but um, I already have that in Texas since I moved. Uh, so it took me less than a year to less than a year to get it. I would guess. Well, I've been here for a year and a half now uh, because I'm out in the parks calling CQ. And you just when you're making a hundred. 200 300 contacts in a few hours at a park you're gonna just by sheer number you're gonna get more opportunities to get them confirmed so that would be my advice log both call cq whether you're at home or in a park give somebody a reason to want to come back to you anyway great question thanks for writing in appreciate it lastly we have a question that i honestly never put any thought into uh just because i already have these tools but uh this viewer writes where can I find a table with crimp sizes for various coaxes? I'm always eyeballing it. So this question piqued my interest, and the short answer is Google. Google. But I have several sets of dies, and I was kind of curious. So I Googled coax, crimp, die sizes, or something to that effect. And while there's not a huge uh, list of lists i did find one that was 99 percent complete and it happened to come from dx engineering and this is what they have and i thought this was great you've got uh basically all of dx engineering stuff which is just their their labeling but so like dx engineering 400 is lmr 400 dx engineering 213 is rg 213 dxe 58 is rg 58 and you've got 8u 8x blah 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 and where these X's are. So let's look at, uh, let's go down to RG213. You can see at the top under die 8U, the hex crimp ferrule is 0.429. That would be the size you need to crimp the ferrule. The one above it is for the center pin, the 0.100. So let's look at RG8X. If you wanted to do that, let's look at the DXE 8X. You'd need a 0.255 hex crimp ferrule. LMR 400, you need a 0.429, which would be the same thing as the RG213U. The only difference would be 
Uh, now, I solder all my pins. I don't usually crimp them, but uh, look at the hex crimp center pin for LMR 400. You need a 0.118 for RG213. You need a 0.100. The only thing that this doesn't have is like RG174, RG316, which are the same size. Uh, and I, I really couldn't find a specific uh, size for that or, or chart that had that included as well. So there's really only three sizes if you look at this. So if you've got RG213, you need a 0.429, which is going to be the same that you would use for uh, LMR400. RG8X, 0.255. Uh, I do have some RG58AU, I believe. Yeah, a little bit thinner than 8X. Uh, and that's 0.213. Google coax crimp die sizes, and you can search this for DX Engineering. I just clicked on I, I clicked on the images tab at the top of Google, and that's how I found this. So, but I, I always just kind of guessed by size, but now I will refer to this chart so I don't screw things up. <laughs> so great question. This actually had had me quite intrigued. So thanks for writing in. And now it's time to put an end to Mailbag Monday, number 22. I think that's Spanish for 22 for all my Spanish-speaking friends. See, we're multilingual here on KMRD Radio stuff. Guys, thanks so much for watching. If you have a question for me, shoot me an email, kmrd at icloud.com. In the subject, just put Mailbag Monday. That way I'll see it. It'll kind of stand out to me, and uh, hopefully we will get your question answered on another episode of Mailbag Monday. So thanks so much for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you again on another episode of KMRD Radio Stuff. 73, guys.